You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lanier. Do you ever feel like you must be living your life the wrong way? Do you compare yourself to others and then feel like shit because you believe they have something that you don't? And is it possible that your frustration may be rooted in a hidden belief that you're entitled to more than you're getting? Mark Manson wrote a book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. He's here to tell us why many believe being average is a failure and why we'd be better off if we weren't so focused on being so special. Welcome to The New Man Today. We're talking with Mark Manson. He's a blogger. He's also the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, A Counterintuitive Approach to Living a Good Life. You can learn more about him at markmanson.net. Mark, thanks for being here. Good to be here, Trip. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're coming all the way from uh, Brazil. I'm getting married in two weeks, so everything's a little crazy and surreal and doesn't <laughs> hasn't yeah. sunk in yet but um uh, but it's it's all good too it's all it's all very exciting I, i'm curious about how, how the title of your book relates to this thing is it's a big deal <laughs> obviously what you're going yeah, through here i uh, I, I do give a fuck about my wedding <laughs> okay <laughs> well I let, uh, that's where i wanted to dive in here is uh <laughs> uh, you know the subtle art of not giving a fuck. I just when I when I first heard it, I'm glad you put the subtle art because it, it's. I just thought of that teenager. It's like I don't care, I don't care, and he's just yeah. kind of indifferent to everything in the world. That's not what you're talking about here. What are you What are you talking about when you talk about the subtle art of not giving a fuck? Yeah, it's it's funny. It's mostly most of the inter- interviews I do, especially with kind of more mainstream like radio and stuff. Everybody focuses on the not giving a fuck and everybody's like whoa why shouldn't we give a fuck shouldn't we care about things and it's actually the most important part of the title is what you just said it's the subtle art part it's Mm. it's the subtlety of paying attention to what you're caring about what you're finding important in your life and really honestly asking yourself is this what's actually important um is this actually going to make my life better or am i just distracting myself or um you know, driving myself crazy. Chances are the thing that we're spinning out about just isn't that important anyway. But if we're just kind of on autopilot mode, it's easy to spin ourselves out about it. But if we take a second, zoom out, hey, wait a second, is this really that important? Probably not. Um, I need to focus on what's more important. I always like to say when you don't know what's important, everything seems important. Uh, Yeah. And it sounds like we've got to take some effort to really drill down to what is most important. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, essentially the book is, it's a book about values. Uh, what I tell people is I, I wrote a book about values, but you know, nobody's going to run to the, to the bookstore to, to buy a million copies of a book about values. Like, it's just not sexy and glamorous. Mm. So um, kind of cover, put a bunch of fucks on there, and uh, people get excited all of a sudden. <laughs> but really, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a way to trick people into thinking about their values. And, it's, and it is, like... I, the first chapter of the book is very irreverent. It's very vulgar. It's uh, like disgusting at points. Um, but in the first chapter, I, I kind of, because I'm joking about all this other stuff, I say like, this is the most important question of your life. That's not a joke though. Like mm. I really do believe that this question of value is like, what do we come to value? What, how do we consciously decide what's important um, is the most important thing? Because if we're choosing Four things to care about, then even if we work hard, even if we're smart about uh, what we're doing, even if we're really lucky or fortunate or successful, we're going to end up in the wrong place. You know, it's like it's like using the wrong map to drive. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to. Most people, you know, I think one of the most important skills is like developing that ability to question your own your own evaluation of things, your own prioritization and um turns out it's a really hard thing to do yeah it is <laughs> so i wrote a book about it <laughs> well, it's it's a great point I, I like that you talk about that because you know you can have this ambition you can have tenacity you can be pers- you know uh persevere and just drive yourself into the ditch too 
uh, if you don't really have a sense of where you're going, I, I talk to so many guys and they say, you know, I want to find my purpose in life. And I, there's, I, I think that's what's missing is I don't have a sense of purpose, but they don't get that there's already a certain purpose there to their life. They already are living a purpose. It just might be that they're trying to prove that they're special or that they're, you know, everything yeah. in their life is to prove that they're acceptable or that they're enough. Um, I want to drill down to this idea about values, though, because um, you, you break them into two points. You've got good values, you've got bad values. Tell us a little bit about the yeah. difference between good values and bad values. It, it gets super abstract, but my personal uh, philosophy, I guess you would call it, is that generally speaking, good values or good things to care about are generally things that are internal, they're controllable. Um, by your own actions and behaviors. Um, they are constructive to the people around you and they're realistic. So, um, you know, really caring about, uh, I don't know, being like emperor of the world or making a billion dollars. Uh, these are generally bad drivers of your behavior. They're bad values that, you know, to allow to drive your life. And and especially the money thing, like everybody's heard a million times, like, you know, um, don't make money the most important thing of your life. Like that's kind of like the quintessential example of a bad value. And the reason it's a bad value is that uh, ultimately you can't totally control how much money you make. Like so much is determined. I mean, economies collapse, uh, that markets go up and down, sectors rearrange themselves, business opportunities come and go lawsuits happen um so much of it's outside of your control and and what happens too is that a lot of people if they're just caring about the the result if they're just caring about the money they're suddenly ignoring all this this other stuff this the you know whether what they're doing is is good for society whether what they're doing is actually supporting the the relationships in their life um you know uh is their family life good? Is their relationship with the community good? Or do they have hobbies? So, you know, things that most people consider like work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, I think what work-life balance essentially means is simply having like a, a good set of values in your life. And because you have a good set of values, you're spending your time doing good things. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I, I want to drill into that a little bit more because when you talk about bad values, you, des you describe them as being superstitious or socially destructive or not immediate or not controllable. And I don't, I, this is where we get on this roller coaster where it seems to be magical. Right. And, and I think that the downside yeah. is when we attach our self worth to those things that are, that are outside of our control or, or they seem magical and, and then our, our self image goes up and down with these things, whether a, a girl looked at us or we got the sale or whatever it is. And, but it seems like this is where we're proving okay, if I get this thing, then I'm a good guy or my life is worthwhile. That's a different shift from, okay, I'm just going to be honest today. I'm going to you know, yep. build strong relationships, uh, those types of things. And then, then it seems like some of those other things that we're talking about may become the product of that. But I, I don't know. It seems like we often have a theory in our mind. If I just had that, if I just had that fucking yep. unicorn, then, then everything would work out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's um, actually a friend of mine put it really well. He said that generally, really good values they tend to be, uh, they tend to be like hygiene. Like they, they're things that you need to repeat. Like you're never finished with them. Mm -hmm. So things like being honest, uh, having a good relationship, you know, good communication with your partner or whoever, um, taking care of your health. These are all things that you have to do every week, every day. Like you're never done being honest in your life. And bad values tend to be these things that, that they have these like finite ends to them. So it's like sleep with a hundred women or make a million dollars. While these things, they can be very motivating. They don't necessarily, they can be self-sabotaging in terms of like happiness and emotional well-being. Right. In the book, you talk about how being average has become the new standard of failure. I, I love that. Um, it's like today's culture and technology has got this emphasis on, hey, look at me, social media stuff. Where it's, it's, it's really starting to screw with our heads. And that somehow being average 
um, means we're we're screwing up. We've got to always if we if we fall unconscious to this stuff, that we seems like we're always trying to prove that we're not average. Um, yeah. Don't be special. Don't be unique. Is is a point that you make in this book. I remember when I was younger, I felt like I was destined to be a rock star. I practiced for hours every day. And these days when I'm in bed by 930 on a Friday, I ask myself, what the fuck happened? I used to be like, <laughs> I wasn't even on stage yet. <laughs> like what happened? But like, but these days I'm much more at peace with myself. Uh, the yeah. theory that I had in my mind back then for being truly happy wasn't quite correct. Um, the, it seems like the more that I used to strive to be special and unique, the more miserable I was at those times. Now I still had a lot of fun playing music, but there was a there was something beyond that of like I needed to be somebody to be really special and unique. That made me miserable. Right. Did you have an experience of that? Totally. I mean, I had that early in my life with music. Um, but it's funny that that Friday night experience you talked about. Like I had for a number of years, I had that exact same experience. So I used to be a big party guy. In fact, um, my big overcompensation as a man. Um, was I became like a womanizer. Like I just chased girls all the time. Mm. And it was to, it was to the point where it was pretty, it was pretty compulsive and it was destructive towards other areas of my life, like mm -hmm. friendships and other things. And, um, and so I, you know, I was this guy who was out at nightclubs like, all the damn time and drinking all the time and doing crazy shit at four in the morning. And, uh, and it was funny starting around the time I turned 30 and, uh, around the same time I, I was, I was met my fiance. I started discovering that like, I didn't really want to go out anymore and I would stay home on a Friday night. And, and, and there was this almost as like guilt, it, you know, it was exactly like you were saying, I'd be sitting at home reading a book on a Friday and I'm like, wow does this mean I'm a loser? Like, did I screw right. something up here? Like <laughs> there's just, just, there's this like inner inertia inside of you that, that's spent so long trying to escape this kind of moment that, um, it's hard to, to just remind yourself, like, you know what, you don't really need to be going out, uh, and talking to cute girls on a Friday night to like be a cool guy, <laughs> you know, like you don't really have to do any of that stuff. Well, there was, I think there was, a, it's a self image thing. It's an identity thing. Like, who am I if I'm not doing yeah. those things? If I'm not doing that, like you said, well, does that mean I'm a loser if I stop doing yeah. those things? Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, and, and what's dangerous is when we construct our identity out of those things that are done, that are motivated out of insecurity. So, you know, my, my chasing girls was, it was rooted in, in some deep insecurities I had around intimacy and other things and mm -hmm. um and because it drove so much of my behavior it, it became part of my identity like all my friends knew me as like the party guy who got with a lot of girls and it's how i thought of myself and it's how i tried to prove myself and and portray myself to others and um and so when you let go of that there's there's and i not only is there this uh kind of shock of like Oh, am I a loser now? But there's also that identity crisis of, wait, who am I? Right. Like maybe, maybe I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and bringing this back to the, the being average thing. Um, one thing that I see in our culture today that concerns me a lot is that, um, the vast majority of the media that we're exposed to primarily through social media, but also through, you know, having 500 TV channels or whatever, I mean, we're basically constantly bombarded with the highlight reel of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't see, if you go on Facebook, like you don't see your friends like crappy lunch that they had yesterday, <laughs> or you don't, you, you know, you don't hear about like all the snot that they blew out when they had a cold last weekend. Like you hear about people getting married, you hear about people like buying a new boat going on a sick vacation somewhere, like having a really cool party. Um, and so it's just, it kind of, I think it creates this perception in people that this is, this is the new normal. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this, you know, I get, I get thousands of emails from readers um, throughout the months through my website. And, and I, I started to notice this, particularly in younger, younger people is that I would get emails from, from people who are, you know, like 20, 21, and 
they would describe their lives and their life was like the quintessential typical good american college experience you know it's like they're smart guys they go to a good school they're doing well in their classes they have friends and they hang out with them yet they were just incredibly upset because they felt like they weren't living up to this this ideal this like hollywood imagery that they had bought into right like they were supposed to be partying every night and getting laid constantly and like there was some other place going, out there that they were supposed to be where everything was happening and they're missing out on it yeah and and this i mean this is another theme in the book too is that <laughs> i try to i try to be be blunt about it but it's like life just like reality is disappointing it's things like our brains our imaginations are very powerful and so they tend to make everything look and sound much better than they will ever be mm -hmm. and and it's just reality it's nuanced it's complex it there's things that are upsetting and difficult and confusing about it and so even if you do have these like fantasies of like oh crazy spring break tons of girls amazing beach you know you actually get there and, and the experience itself is much more complex mm. and bittersweet mm -hmm. and i think people who when we're living so much of our lives on the internet it's it that's a very hard lesson that's a very hard pill for for people to swallow because the internet like the, the social media and everything like it doesn't want you to realize that it it you know the internet it churns like the reason it keeps existing and the reason people make money um, in the current media age is, is by selling these fantasies and selling these perceptions. And um, that reality just, it's not, it's not something that's very sexy or glamorous. Yeah. So again, I had to put a bunch of fucks in the book. So people would actually, <laughs> yeah, you it. It. <laughs> well, I think, I, I think there's also a sense there is like, if I'm not, if, I, if that's not happening in my life, I must be doing it wrong. Um, right. that, that there's a, there's a thing like we turn the blade on ourselves, like you moron, you're not getting it right because your life doesn't look like the highlight reel that isn't even real, uh, in an R E A L yeah. sense. So, um, you, you talk in the book about, you know, kind of the mundane, you talk about even the negative experience. You said the desire for a more positive experience is itself a negative experience and paradoxically the acceptance of one's ne negative experience is itself a positive experience. I'm a uh, card-carrying, uh, reformed personal development jackass, which means I got into personal <laughs> development. I got into personal development to get to try and find a way to escape negativity and to right. escape vulnerability. Um, and so I was amazed at sometimes like, well, wait a second, I'm working really hard. I'm fucking meditating and I'm doing all this stuff and I'm still having hard times in life. I must be doing it wrong. So I'm glad that you brought this up, but I want to come back to that quote because I want to understand what it means. Let me read it again. The desire for a more positive experience is itself a negative experience and paradoxically the acceptance of one's negative experience is itself a positive experience. Drill into that. What do you mean? Yeah. So this is actually an idea. Um, I mean, it's in a lot of philosophy, but um, Alan Watts calls it the backwards law. And it basically, it's a little quirk of, of our brains where the moment you start wanting something, desiring something, trying to work towards pursuing something, um, even if it's something really good, you know, world peace or whatever, um, the fact that you want that, you are unconsciously just reaffirming that you don't have it you know so it's like if i decide today it's like i'm going to um i'm going to start a new business and make million dollars in the next year like that's a great goal it's a great thing to work towards but a side effect of having that goal having that desire for that positive experience is that i'm reaffirming to myself that i am not that successful entrepreneur right now and in very like isolated situations that's fine but one thing that worries me is kind of create this this and, and you mentioned being a self-help jackass i'm also a reformed self-help jackass <laughs> who used to constantly chase these positive experiences over and over when right. we're kind of like trained 
they constantly seek this positivity, what we're actually doing is constantly reaffirming of ourselves of things that we are not, things that we are failing to be, failing to become. Right. And so it's this paradoxical thing where the most liberating thing you can do is actually stop and be like, oh, you know what? Sometimes I'm not happy and that's okay. Hey. <laughs> uh-huh. like there's nothing wrong with that uh unhappiness is a natural natural completely natural um functional part of a human life and um feeling unhappy or feeling distressed or feeling insecure like these are not these are not things to 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 worry about or or to try to escape from in fact it's that embracing of those negative experiences that suddenly liberates you to not be controlled by them anymore yeah, so I don't have to run away from this. I can accept this is part of life. I can be informed by this. This can be information for me. This is good feedback for me. But um, I think there's this part of our mind like, oh, I'm, it, I'm not doing it right because I'm not happy all the time, and there must be something wrong with me. And I just, I, I run into a lot yeah. of people that seem, they don't, it's not necessarily a conscious belief, but they're kind of coming to me like, yeah, Trip, that's what I want. I'm like, man, you're missing it. <laughs> we got to start yeah. from already yeah. okay. We want to start from already okay. And then build from there. You know, let's build relationships and and whatever you want from that place. Uh, is otherwise, you're always going to be miserable. You're always affirming that you're not enough. You're always affirming that things are screwed up in your life and and turning the blade on yourself, so to speak. Um, yeah, and and it, and it makes sense. I mean, if you buy into this idea that life can be this like constant magazine advertisement. Um, then yeah, the only conclusion you can ever come to is that I'm doing it wrong, mm-hmm. and and the and the solution isn't to necessarily to like try to improve every aspect of yourself. I mean, self improvement's good, but it's not. You're not trying to fix yourself. It's it's recognizing that reality is a messy, painful beast, and um, and that's okay. Life is it's very complicated, and that self improvement doesn't have to come from a place of of lack self-improvement can come from a place of simply um i want my life to be a little bit better i want to have a little bit more control over over what i do or or what i enjoy right which is different than i'm fucked and i suck and yeah i'm doing it wrong and this is gonna make me happy right yeah this is the thing you talk about entitlement a lot in this book and you point at how it shows up and creates a ton of misery for us um, it's, it seems like it's a huge blind spot for, for many of the people that this book is aimed at. What do you mean by entitlement? Because I was kind of blown away how you were connecting this, so many of the points in the book to entitlement. So the first thing, like, how do you, how do you define entitlement? How does it look to you? So I, I define entitlement, I think a little bit different than, than most people think of it. Um, I basically define it as people who believe they deserve special treatment. And what I mean by special treatment is that they believe that life should work differently for them. Um, they believe that life should, should differ from the reality in general, or that it should differ, um, from how life works for other people. And I think this is one of those concepts that, um, think everybody when they hear that they're like oh yeah totally man like, right. nobody deserves special treatment you know and then they they turn around and they like start yelling at a waiter because there's too much ice in their water or something and um it's entitlement is it's something it's not like um it's not like an all or nothing thing like we all have a certain degree i mean we're all selfish creatures to a certain extent and so we all have a certain degree of entitlement like you know all of our thoughts and experiences are limited ourselves so in a certain sense like we all um filter information through our own experience and so it's natural that that you know we think whatever we do or or we want is is a little bit special in some sense and so the problem is that when you have a a culture that kind of enables that um you know one of the one of the points that i make in on my site um, is that I think unintentionally advertising and tumor culture kind of enables greater senses of entitlement, you know? So, um, you know, you just, you turn on a 
the TV and watch a, a football game or something. And every single commercial is like, like you deserve to have the freedom to drive your truck, you know, in the mountains and you deserve. And then the next one's like, you deserve to have financial security. And then the next one is like, you deserve to have a safe and healthy family. And then it's like over and over advertising is telling you like, Oh, you deserve special treatment. Uh, that's why you should buy my product. And it's, I mean, advertising, advertisement at its core is it, it kind of appeals to our our psychological, like our base psychological instincts, our selfishness and, and insecurities and things like that. And um, I think when you have a, a culture that's just constantly bombarding people with these messages because they sell so well, um, you get a lot of people walking around thinking like, well, I, I deserve to to have everything the way I want it. You know, it's, this is, I work hard, so I deserve to, um, have an easy life and be happy all the time. And I think once you get to that point, it becomes dangerous because, um, once people feel that they deserve to feel success and happiness all the time, um, that's when they start doing unethical things or blinding themselves to, to, the unethical side effects of their own behavior. Like what? And what that's that what I what, see. What does that mean? Like, give me an example of that. Sure. So the example I use in a book is actually a guy I used to know. Um, and non-coincidentally, he was another one of these self-help jack- like jackasses, all positivity all the time, you know, like hustling, working his ass off. Um, he was constantly talking about like starting businesses and, and, uh, like hedge funds and, and, or, or sorry, doing like venture capital shit. And like, he, he was always just going on and on about like all these business ventures he had going. And when you first meet him, it, he seems like this amazingly successful and charismatic guy. And the more I got to know him, the more I realized that it was all kind of smokes and mirrors. Like he, he was basically, uh, borrowing money from family members and not paying them back and spending a bunch of his money on, on pot and um and stealing ideas from his business partners and but if you ever confronted him about this kind of stuff it was always like oh well you know this guy he couldn't handle uh the the work you know my standards of of the kind of work that we want to do so i'm just cutting him out of the deal like there was always an an example there was always an excuse Mm -hmm. um of, of why like he was too good and these other people couldn't handle him and, so he was justified so he just, in in his choice to kind of be a dick. Right. And uh-huh. and he felt and the, the scariest thing about it was this guy felt good all the time. Like <laughs> he felt good <laughs> he about it. He sounds like a raging like, narcissist when I read this part. He, he he was. And the funny thing is, is I the original term I used in the book was narcissism. And there's all sorts of like research that's gone on that's finding like narcissism is is becoming more common. Um over the past few decades in the population. And, um, and so I wanted to talk about this idea and how narcissism is very much like a reaction to, it's exactly what you said at the beginning of the podcast, which is people who don't care about anything in the, or yeah, people who don't va- like, don't know what they care about end up caring about everything. And I think a, one thing that seems to be happening these days is that it's getting harder and harder, you know, Life is getting more complex. Um, life is not nearly as simple as it was, say, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And so it's, it's, it's extremely hard these days for people to get clear about what matters to them, what, what they care about. It's, it's this paradox of choice. Like We have so many opportunities in 2016 that it's that much harder to know what we should do. Mm. And because we don't know what we should do or what we, what we should care about, we we just get sucked into, um, you know, all these frivolous things and, and constantly like chasing, feeling good all the time. And, um, and if I don't feel good, then somehow it's the world's fault because I'm entitled to it. I deserve to feel good. And it's not my fault if I don't feel good. It's not my responsibility. Right. Okay. All right. You, you, you you do a great job of kind of highlighting this in the book that there's two sides of this entitlement. The one is I'm so special and I'm better than everybody. Therefore, the rules of you know for everybody else don't apply to me. And then the other side is I'm so unfortunate 
and I've been so screwed over by the world that I'm entitled to something. And I thought that was interesting that on both sides of the bell curve with average in the middle, that there were the those were there were those that felt entitled on either side. And it was a kind of a reality distortion field there. Yeah, I I think this was a point I really wanted to make. Um because I've seen I've seen this in my own work a lot. Like you you've got so you've got people like the raging narcissist I just talked about, you know, nothing's his fault. He's so awesome. People can't handle him. Uh, Is this guy running for president? I just want to check in and just see. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. But... <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to. Hey, yeah. Just between me and you. Right. Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> but yeah, uh, they, let's just put it this way. They would get along very well. Um, <laughs> um, but you have that side of the spectrum. Right. You know, you have this irrational belief in one's own superiority and deservingness. Um, but I've also noticed that there are a lot of people who are on the other side of the spectrum where it's like, I'm such a victim. The world has shat on me so many times. Look at this horrible thing that happened to me. How, you know, how could you hold this against me? And it's almost this, this victimization, the self victimization. Um, or it's not self victims. I mean, because people are actually victims of things, but it's people who take these negative experiences that they have in their life and they construe it as a justification to also be just as selfish and irrational about right. their place in the world. Um, they become a, identified yeah. with it, and that's they get kind of a false sense of um, in bo- like okay, this is my identity now, and now I'm going to navigate life through this lens. I'm entitled to shit because of what happened to me. Yeah, and it's it's the same sort of narcissism. It's just a the opposite explanation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I'm such shit that I deserve special treatment, and I deserve things to be different for me. Um, and what this all comes back to is, is kind of that original theme of this need to feel special. Um, mm-hmm. Because really, what what this narcissism is driven by is this need to be special all the time. This mm-hmm. need to to believe that you're somehow different, that you're fundamentally uh, unique in some way from everybody else in the population. I mean, yeah, we're all unique, blah blah blah. But like right. on a moral level, um, we're not. Like it, it's it's and in fact, even you know. Yes, some people are more talented at certain things than others. Some people have live more enjoyable lives or have are more fortunate in different ways. But um, ultimately, you know, ninety nine percent of everything that we all do uh, is very mundane and very average and very unnoteworthy, and um, that. <laughs> Does not again. It's a message that is not sexy or glamorous, but it's very liberating once you accept it, because yeah. it suddenly relieves all this pressure from yourself to constantly be proving something or seeking this validation. Yeah, that's the only road that that's going to have me be happy is if I'm this truly exceptional, different from the rest of the herd, truly unique snowflake, and uh, got everything coming my way that I deserve. That's the only way I'll be happy. Um, big theme through this book is let that shit go. Cause that's, what's driving you nuts. Uh, yeah. and lo and behold, you're going to find a really great sense, uh, at least just some peace. Um, and then you can go create stuff. It doesn't mean you just sit there on the couch and waste away, but without that, that thing there, like I have to be this guy, um, this kind of internal yardstick that always stays out of reach. It, you never get there. Yeah. There's no exoneration he, from that, you know? Yeah. And, and what a lot of people, you know, so the, the first, you know, a lot of people, they immediately resist this idea, you know, and, the, and their first reaction, their first negative reaction is like, well, if I'm not going to try to be special, then like, why do anything at all? And it's, again, I, this letting go of this, this need or desire to be, to, to be special or to prove something, um, I've actually found it's, it's led to more productivity and actually technically more success in my own life. Like I've, for instance, just in my writing, I've noticed over the years in my writing and, and looking back at my music career or my lack of music career, like why my music aspirations fizzled out and never went anywhere. Um, 
I can, it's the same reason too. It's when I'm sitting down to write something, I've noticed in my own mind, if I sit down to write something and I'm convinced that the idea that I have is going to change the world and it's going to be the best article or book that anybody's ever read in their life, um, I clam up and freak out and become incredibly neurotic and don't really write much of anything and what yeah. does come out is not very good. It's those moments when I sit down and I'm like, well, I've got this idea. It's kind of funny. It's kind of cool. I don't know if people will like it. I don't even know if I'll like it, but I'm going to sit down and write it anyway. That's when my best work comes out. And um, that's something that, you know, I've had to learn to kind of manage in myself. And I look back at my musical aspirations. I think when I was, I, I had the same dreams as you. I wanted to be a rock star. I used to listen to albums and envision myself on stage and, yeah. you know, have all these fantasies and stuff. And in hindsight, it's scared the living shit out of me because mm. I I had these like hugely unrealistic expectations and demands for myself and I attached myself worse to it. Um, and as a result, yeah. You weren't allowed to anyway. suck. There's a, there's a point in there where you, you, yeah. where you suck. <laughs> like you really do. It's yeah. really bad. You know, the first time you record yourself, you're like, oh my God, that's terrible. Uh, yeah. if you're not allowed to suck, it's really painful. So I, the thing I'm getting here is like, if you've got to be this huge, badass success and you never allow yourself to go through that period of sucking, um, yeah, yeah you don't go anywhere. You just, you get to sit which, on the sidelines and watch the, <laughs> watch the everybody else play. Which comes back to the embracing the negative experience becomes the positive experience. There you go. Beautiful. Awesome, man. I'm glad we, I'm glad we, I'm glad you brought that back around. That's very cool. Um, check out the book. I love this book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, A Counterintuitive Approach to Living a Good Life, markmanson.net. Mark, thanks so much for talking today, man. Thanks, man. It was good. If these interviews are helping you, then please visit The New Man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.